AMP license, let's talk about it. In this video, I'll talk about the process through which you'll get your AMP license, the requirements for eligibility and experience, some ways you can help pay for it. This video is gonna be geared mostly towards our veterans and active duty, but it will apply to you civilians, so stick around and watch. I'm Brian Baker, commercial pilot, AMP mechanic, and car enthusiast. Come with me as I do some burnouts, fly helicopters, and try not to break anything. I'm a U.S. Air Force veteran. I served for 10 years as a jet engine mechanic on C-130s and 860 helicopters. And a couple of years before I got out, I got my AMP license paid for through the Air Force Cool Program. What's an AMP license? An AMP license is actually two licenses, your airframe license and your power plant license, but it colloquially is called an AMP license. If you ask the old guys, they're going to tell you it's a license to learn, and that's all it is. Nobody's going to expect you to show up day one with your AMP license and just go to work. There's going to be some training on each individual airframe you go to work on, so that's what you can kind of expect. Most of the information in this video is going to come from the Electronic Code of Federal Regulations, Title 14. Um, I'll refer to them as far as several parts that apply to uh, mechanics, but for getting your license, the part that's going to retain to you most is part 65. As an aspiring a &P mechanic, it's a good idea to start digging into the FARs. You're going to have to be familiar with them for both the test and in your career um, because they are your guidance in a lot of areas. General eligibility. You need to be 18 years old, be able to read, write, and speak English. You need to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident. Tickets. So. It's a term we've all heard, you gotta get your tickets before you can get your, take your AMP test. Tickets are just a colloquial term for the FAA Form 8610-2. Your 8610-2s are your permission to take the tests for your AMP. In order to get your tickets, you have to have substantiated experience that you can show to a FISDO, Flight Center District Office. Somebody at the FISDO will be able to sign on your tickets so that you can then take the test to become an AMP. Every major airport or should have a FISDO. You should be able to contact that FISDO office and ask them what they would like to see whenever you submit your 8610-2s. Everyone's going to be a little bit different. Some of them are going to be more stringent than others. To find a FISDO office near you, you go to this website and then you're going to click on your state. And you're going to submit and then it will bring up a map of FISDO offices in your area. For the 8610-2, I'll put a link in the description along with all the other links that I'm going to mention from here on out. There will be a copy of it down in the in the description. Alright, experience. So as you would expect, in order to become a certificated airframe and power plant mechanic, you need to have uh, experience. Your experience has to be 30 months working on aircraft, um, and that is for both the airframe and power plant combined. If you're gonna get just the airframe or just the power plant, you're only required 18 months of experience. Now you can get that experience a couple of different ways. Um, you can get it through working for an aircraft company or whenever you're in the military, working on aircraft uh, under your AFSC or MOS, whatever your job code is, or you can go to an AMP school, and that's another way to get it, and we'll talk about the AMP schools later. Now, you have to have recency of experience, and your recency of experience has to be six months working on aircraft within the last 24 months. Now, whenever you try to go get your tickets from the FISDO, you're, he's going to reference a document that is going to explain to him, especially if he's not been in the military, what your experience should be based on your job code alone. For instance, my job in the Air Force was aerospace propulsion. The job code for AFSC was 28671. And if I look in this document, it says that I am only qualified based on my job code to get the power plant license. However, what you can do is you can have added to your CFETP or training records the uh, other tasks from other career fields like sheet metal and structures, hydraulics, fuel. Um, you can have other people add and sign you off on other tasks outside of your career field so that you can then qualify for that airframe portion or if it's the other way around and you need to qualify for the power plant portion it's good to get with some engine, engine guys and see if they can't sign you off on some of those tasks. It might be worth letting your supervision know that you're only getting these tasks signed off so that you can get your AMP and it's not necessarily that you're going to go start doing that work for the military. At least that was my experience. All right another way to get all of those tasks signed off is the Joint Service Aviation Maintenance Certification Council or JSAMTCC 
is a program that encompasses all of the services, Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines, and I believe Coast Guard as well. It's, it's a slight, slightly different flavor for each service. However, it is a very large and comprehensive death by PowerPoint and CBT based training that will teach you in a way that is uh, geared towards your A&P exam. Another benefit of it is the CCAF, Community College of the Air Force, will award you 30 semester hours for the completion of your A&P through this program. All right, A&P schools. A&P schools come in two flavors, your vocational A&P schools and your collegiate A&P schools. Your vocational uh, A&P schools mean that there's no degree associated with it. You're just working towards completing all the basic requirements to get your A&P license or so that somebody will sign off those tickets. Your college programs also come with a two-year associate's degree. The benefit of one over the other is um, not much. However, they're both really, really good ideas if you're starting from ground zero or if you're transitioning from uh, military aircraft and let's say you have been out of the service for a while, you're trying to get back into aviation. Another alternative is A&P prep courses and I call them cheat courses, but basically they just teach you the test. This is going to be the best option for those folks that have been in the military and working as aircraft mechanics, um, but just need to basically study up for the test. You have to show up to the school with your tickets, so they're not going to teach you anything that's going to get you your tickets. You have to have those already. But even if you wanted to do this after your A&P school, it's just going to help you uh, brush up right before you go take your actual tests. Usually as a part of the school, of the prep courses, you take your written exams, your general airframe and power plant, in preparation for your oral and practical. There are several of these schools around the country, uh, only two of which I know about for sure. One's in Georgia and one's in Riverside, California. The one in Riverside, California is the one I went to whenever I was doing my a &P license. Another benefit of these is that they're covered by the Air Force school program and I believe the other services as well. You can qualify for a permissive TDY through the Air Force under AFI 36 dash 3003 table 4.5 rule 7 and it basically says that if you're going to do some testing as part of a school program you're allowed to do that all right so as i kind of previously covered there are four tests for your airframe and power plant license you have your general which you have to take no matter what you have to take your general and you have to take your oral and practical even if you're only taking the airframe or you're only taking the power plant you still have to take the general and the oral and practical if you do one and then come back for the other you have to take the oral and practical again for that second edition you don't have to retake the general though. Each test, each written test of three written tests, costs $175 a piece. Your oral and practical is somewhere between $700 and $1,700. I've even heard crazy stories of them being as much as $2,100. The test can be anywhere from eight hours to three days per regulation. And I'll put a link below of some of the testing standards where you can get the testing standards for all three of the written tests online. There are tons and tons of study material sources all over the internet, um, books, things you can get off Amazon. I used prepware quite heavily and it was a, that was a real help. Another thing that you need to know about the test is once you start, you have 24 months to complete them, paying for it all. The Air Force, Army, Navy, and Marines cool programs. There's the GI Bill slash Yellow Ribbon program. There's the vocational rehabilitation. There's the Pell Grant or FAFSA and there's student loan school. For your GI Bill, I'm gonna recommend for your GI Bill that if you're active duty, you avoid using your GI Bill to pay for your A&P license. It's just not worth it. Um, there are other options that are better for you. If you're out of the military, you can use your GI Bill to go to A&P school, to the two-year program, and, or you can use it to just pay for the test. I'll put a link down below how to use your use it just for uh, licensing and certifications and they'll pay for up to $2,000 per license or certification uh, test. To find out if your school is eligible to use the GI Bill, there's the WEMS tool. You can go to the Veterans Affairs website and use the WEMS tool to search for schools that accept VA benefits and GI Bill benefits. You can, you can search by state by institution and then you can look at each institution's programs and see what they offer and how much they cover. The WEMS tool will also tell you if a school is yellow ribbon. Vocational rehabilitation, also known as Chapter 31 benefits, or VRNE. Vocational rehabilitation is something you have access to if you have a VA service-connected disability of 10% or higher and you've received anything other than a dishonorable discharge. There's a lot of caveats to it, but you can talk over the phone with a counselor who's going to help you pick a career path 
And if you already know what you want to do, like getting your AMP license, it'll make it a lot easier. They'll try to help you pay for any of the things that you need to get your AMP license. For more information, I'll put a link down below. So the last I'm going to talk about is the Air Force, Army, Navy, and Marine cool programs. Sorry, US Coast Guard. I don't think there's anything for you guys, but I could be wrong. Army has a cool program. The Navy has a cool program. And the Air Force has a cool program. And they're all basically the same. You click on the resources. You enter your, or you select your AFSC or your MOS or your job title. Then it'll bring up all of the certifications and, qual and licenses that you qualify for. You go down to AMP and it will tell you how to go about getting that license. The cool thing about it is it will pay for the AMP prep course. In addition to that, you can qualify for permissive TDY while using Air Force Cool. If you have any more questions about this, feel free to leave the question down in the comments and I'll try to get you an answer, an accurate answer, as soon as possible. If you like this content and you'd like to see more like it, please subscribe to the channel, share it with your fellow aspiring AMP mechanics. Thank you for your service and thanks for watching.